edge is falling off of the bookshelf. Oh, well. Welcome everyone to tonight's show. We're uh, proud to bring you Earl Gray Anderson, uh, MUFON State Director. Uh, he does Southern California as a MUFON Director. He's also um, an executive member of MUFON's Experience and Resource Team, and he has personally investigated over 900 UFO reports and specializes in experiencer high strangeness cases. And I'll leave the rest of his uh, intro to himself. Welcome to that show, uh, Earl Anderson. Hi there, Mike. You did pretty well there. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to tell people other than that. I, my, my buddy Ruben Uriarte, he's up in Northern California and he kind of handles everything uh, north of, of the Fresno area. Uh, we're such a busy state in in uh, California that it's one state we had to kind of split in two and, and, and have we actually have two state directors. Luckily, we, we both get along really well and Ruben's a, a good, good close friend. So works well, out you, beautifully. You are an experience yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, you got you were telling me about your mother. So I don't know if you want to go with your own personal experiences first or your mom. Whichever one of those two is your uh, would seem logical for you. Go ahead and uh, run with it. Sure. I mean, chronologically probably makes the most sense. <laughs> um, well, my mom, uh, she she had some interesting stories when I was growing up. Uh, the main one, it was no secret. The whole family knew that my mom was one of Howard Hughes's private secretaries. She worked in the uh, Hughes Aircraft uh, Sepulveda facility they had here in Los Angeles. And I, I actually teach a college course in ufology at Otis College of Art and Design. And all the streets that are around it, it's Howard Hughes Parkway, Howard Hughes this, Howard Hughes that. And it's for a good reason. Um, that was, you know, he, he had his Hollywood office because he was a film producer at one point. Uh, but he had his uh, his Hughes aircraft facility is where my mom worked. And uh, she had an office that was right next to his. But uh, if you've seen the film The Aviator, it's, it's actually pretty accurate about um, Hughes, especially after he'd had his plane accident and all that. He was he kind of became a, a hermit. He uh, was a bit of a misanthrope, didn't like people that much. And he was a germaphobe. <laughs> so my mom worked for him for a few years, but she only saw him in person one time. Uh, they would communicate over an intercom system that he had set up. So, um, and and this was something that we, you know, my my mom's best friend, we, we called her Aunt Ellen. Uh, her name was Ellen Severson. She, she worked for the Rand Corporation, which at one point, point was part of Hughes Aircraft. Uh, the interesting thing about Rand Corporation that I found is that uh, the Rand Corp, along with the Army Corps of Engineers, are the guys that built most of our deep underground uh, military secret facilities. Um, you know, they've, they, they did a lot of uh, massive things like the Hanson Dam here in Los Angeles. You can see it says the Army Corps of Engineers right up on top. And if you look into it a little bit, the Rand Corporation did a lot of work with uh, with the Army. It was my mom was more or less working for an early form of the military industrial complex. Uh, she knew interesting people. My mom personally knew Werner von Braun. Uh, we'd be watching Disney, you know, the Wonderful World of Disney. It was actually the Wonderful World of Color when it when it first came out. Color TVs were sort of a new thing. And uh, Werner von Braun would come on and talk about the staging of rockets. His, his, that was his idea uh, for us to get to the moon. And instead of using one big mighty rocket, you you divide it into three parts. And, and this way you would build your inertia. Um, so anyway, my mom, he, he would come on to the Disney thing and my mom would go, that's my friend Werner. 
And she'd talk about him. She said that he used to call her Betty Grace. That was her first and her middle name. Mom's maiden name. Uh, it, it gets a lot of laughs from people, uh, Social Security or whoever, when they ask my mother's maiden name because it was actually Maiden. Her name was Betty Grace Maiden. But, um, yeah, in her travels, she knew Werner von Braun. She knew Oberth and some of the other uh, German rocket scientists that we acquired through uh, Operation Paperclip. You know, Russia got their little uh, number of rocket scientists, and we took our guys. And, uh, well, Werner is who got us to the moon. He was a very interesting guy. And as we found out, he did know about the UFO phenomena, quite quite dramatically so. Um so when I was around, let's see, when, when I was about five years old, and I'd heard some weird stories. I mean, my mom talked about one story uh, when she was 16 years old. She, she grew up in uh, Muscatine, Iowa, and they used to sleep. Uh, she and her sister would sleep on little sleeping rolls on their porch. It was a screened-in porch. And she used to talk about this. She called it her ball lightning incident, but it, it wasn't ball lightning. Um, which I'll explain in a moment. But she said that her her sister was about 11 years old and mom was about 16, and she was getting ready to fall asleep. Her sister was already asleep when this ball of sparks pushed its way through the screen. Uh, she said it was about the size, a little bit between a basketball and a beach ball that size. And that this thing just pushed itself through the screened-in porch uh, she said that it was buzzing like a hive of bees. And this thing went over and hovered over her sister for like five good seconds, just hung there right over her. And my mom said she was up on her elbows. She she thought that it was ball lightning. Well, it came right up, she said, like eye level. It was It was maybe a foot away from her, almost as though it was perusing her or, or you know, observing her. Um. It, she said that if it had eyes, they would have made eye contact. It was right up to her face. She said that it went back through the screen, and again, it buzzed like a, a hive of bees. And she watched it travel in the air um, across their yard. And, and so my mom got up out of her sleeping bag. She She pushed open the door, and she followed this ball of sparks out to the middle of uh, their, the neighbor's cornfield. And she, the way she expressed it, she said it was almost as though it was waiting for her. It was like a will of the wisp or something. It was just waiting about 30 feet above ground. Um, so she got right under it, and she was looking up at it. And she said that it was maybe, you know, five or ten seconds, and then the thing popped like a soap bubble. And it just disappeared. And she said that you could smell electricity in the air. It's ozone that was there that she smelled. Um, that was a story that she kind of told everybody. She told me, my sister, my dad, and relatives. Uh, and she she thought that it was ball lightning. But I've spoken with, you know, like my friend uh, I, Irina Scott is, is a PhD. And she's... Uh, studied electrical phenomena quite extensively, and she said that ball lightning only lasts about three to five seconds. And this lasted, at least, uh, it was over a minute, you know, it's more like two, three minutes that this thing kept its, retained its shape. And plus, it was under intelligent control. It, it seemed like it was looking at, at my mom, at my Aunt Mary first, and it waited for my mom to go out to this field. Um, so I feel like this this phenomenon is, is sort of followed my family, uh, and and what my mom described it, it actually matches more like the Foo Fighters that uh, that they saw during World War II. You know, the the Army Air Corps would run into they, they these would be would follow our planes. In fact, my dad was a tail gunner in a B seventeen, and he said that they used to follow his plane. Um, the, the Germans thought that it was our secret weapon. We thought that it was the Germans' Wunder weapon. But uh, no, it was, as far as I'm concerned, it was the same kind of probe that was, you know, that, that, that checked my mom out when she was a young girl. So anyway, the years went by, and, and this was in the mid-1950s. I wasn't born yet, but that was when my mom was working for Hughes. And uh, 1963... 
I, I went into our kitchen for breakfast. I was five years old. And I sat down to my to my breakfast, and my mom started talking to me with this weird tone of voice. It was like she was talking to another adult. And she told me this story about how she, she was working at Hughes. They sent her out. They didn't tell her where she was going to go, but they sent her out to this remote location. She said it was the Great American Desert. She didn't say which one. Um, sometimes I think it might have been White Sands, uh, New Mexico, or could have even been Area 51, because they Hughes did have an underground facility in 1953. Uh, he was the first private contractor that had a had had a facility, a lab over at uh, the Area 51 uh, spot in the desert. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, but they. They didn't say, I, I, I imagine they flew her, they had to have flown her out, I guess. And, uh, but what she said was that she had a little key tail with her and uh, they didn't tell her what they were going to show her. But they took her to this bunker. It was this low slung concrete bunker in the middle of the desert. And they opened this thing up and it had an elevator inside. Uh, my mom got into the elevator with the security guys and she, she said that she figured it would go down a floor or two, but it just kept on going down. And she said that she felt butterflies in her stomach. I, I have really good memory, and I, I can remember the conversation pretty darn well. She said that when the doors of this elevator opened up, there was a little city under the desert. She said it was a mile under the desert, middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, when she saw the bunker, it didn't look like much. I mean, it was all locked up, but she thought maybe tools or a tractor. They, she didn't know why they had taken her out to this remote area. But uh, when the doors opened up, she she figured out what it was. She said that uh, it was a lot of different scientists that worked down there, working on very, very secret projects, she said. They got around in golf carts that they had. Uh, she said that they had little cafes down there movie theater uh they had a barber shop where the guy could actually fix her hair for her and through her telling me that you know i imagine she must have spent you know long blocks of time down there you know you don't have to have your hair done you know all, every day but uh, but she did mention that there was somebody that could do her hair for her um and then the way that she ended the conversation was she said and by the way ufos and intelligent life in the universe is a very real thing. She said this isn't hypothetical. Uh, I don't think she used the word hypothetical, but but I, she she made it known to me. She's she like tagged it onto the end of the conversation. She said we already know that we're not alone in the universe. So I grew up with that. You know, I grew up with that bit of knowledge. And uh, at certain points in my life, I tried to get her to talk more about it. Um, I kind of got in trouble over it in fourth grade because we had, uh, you know, in my fourth grade class, I went and I gave a little show and tell. It was, what do your parents do? Uh, and so I talked about my dad's landscaping business. And then I talked about my mom, how she used to work for Howard Hughes in this deep underground military facility that was secretive in the middle of the desert. And oh, by the way, UFOs are real and intelligent life. We already know that we're not alone in the universe. So my teacher called, a, she called my mom to come in for a, a teacher student or teacher parent conference. And I remember my mom going in there. It was unusual because the other kids weren't going in for, you know, their parents weren't being called in for conferences. It wasn't that time of year. But I guess that uh, my story upset my teacher. And, and plus, the other kids started teasing me and, you know, making fun of, you know, bringing up the great gazoo from the Flintstones, like, the, you know, aliens and stuff. My favorite Martian. <laughs> And I kind of became the, the butt of some jokes. And I guess that that upset my teacher as well. So what I remember very, very well, at this point I was 10 years old. My mom hadn't really added to what she told me when I was five. Um, she's driving me home and she looks at me and she says, son, I'm not mad at you. But you can't ever, ever talk about 
the deep underground play, you know, the city under the desert. You, you can, you certainly can't talk about UFOs and, and intelligent life in the universe. Um, she said, uh, how did you remember that? You were, you were a baby. <laughs> it was her exact words. And she's trying to drive, you know, while she's, you know, having this kind of emotional talk with me. And this is when she told me, she said, son, your mother could get into terrible trouble if you ever talk about this. I could go to prison, she said. Um, and that, that's when I knew that the world was a lot different than, you know, that, than I thought it was, that other people thought it was. And that stuck with me through my life. You know, I had my ups and downs. I, you know, had, was a rebellious teenager like most kids my age growing up in the 1970s and all that musician. Um, but I kept returning to that. It was like this little spot of wonder and, and, and this big, huge question mark in my life. Um, and my mom started working again. She got tired of being a housewife. She hated it. <laughs> I think her life before was really interesting. And, you know, staying at home and doing dishes and cooking casseroles wasn't really her cup of tea. So she went back to work as a, a headhunter for the aerospace companies. She, she ran a temporary employment agency. But what I noticed was, was that all of her clients, it was like Raytheon and, and, and uh, Lockheed and Rockwell International. Uh, it, was, it was just like, you, you name it. You know, she was, she was getting uh, engineers and scientists out to all these different aerospace companies. And I think probably the reason why is because she, she did retain her security clearances. Uh, I mean, she told me that uh, on her deathbed. She told me that, you know, I, I kept all my, you know, my high security clearances and and uh, and I'm proud of what I did. That's what my mom told me when she was dying. It was 1999. Um, my mom talked a little bit more about what she did when I, uh, I took her to see the film Star Wars in 1977. And when the film was over, she just, it was like the floodgates opened. Something, the stars aligned somehow for me because she started saying, you know, son, I mean, that movie is so close to the truth. The different life forms, aliens and the, the different spaceships and all that. She said, but you know what, son, they're never, ever going to tell the public about it. You're never going to tell them. And I asked her why. I said, why, why, why not? You know, this people should know this that we're not alone. I mean, I think that people would would live differently. She said because they're afraid of how people react. Uh, she brought up the she brought up the uh, War of the Worlds radio broadcast and, and and where people were jumping out of windows and draining bank accounts and stuff and. You know, she said they're afraid people will panic and that it would cause just social unrest. She said that, but it's real, son. She said it's realer than you will ever know. Um, and that little phrase, realer than you will ever know, that stuck with me. It, it actually kind of bothered me because I really, really wanted to know. Um, you know, and, and this is one of the things officials will tell somebody if they're like i know barry goldwater tried to get into the Wright patterson blue room at one point you know where apparently the roswell wreckage was stored and he was told uh, that curiosity is not need to know never ask that question again no <laughs> and that, but you know this is the stuff that i grew up with so when my mom passed in 1999 I started reading a lot of UFO literature. Before that, I'd just like try to get it out of my mom, you know, and sometimes I would get a little bit more. Sometimes she would usually just was, you know, loose lips, sink ships kind of mentality that she had. Um, but when she passed away, uh, I decided that sitting, you know, being a couch ufologist was not cutting it, that everybody had different, you know, opinions and ideas. And so the best way to learn about this thing was to go hands on. And uh, the name MUFON kept popping up from book to book to book. Um, when Project Blue Book closed their doors in 1969, uh, that, that's when MUFON opened their doors. So uh, about eight years ago, I joined MUFON and it totally changed my life. I mean, it, it, I think that, it, honest to God, it's, it's one of the b very best decisions I've ever made. 
And uh, as you mentioned, you know, towards the beginning of the show, uh, now I'm up to like 950 cases <laughs> that I've investigated and and uh, closed. Uh, out of those, you know, most of them are drone sightings and military flares and this and that. But I think we're around 78 solid unknowns now, which is pretty good. That's that's right around uh, Dr. Uh, Hynek's numbers that he said. You know, he said that uh, five to ten percent of UFO reports wind up being interesting, and uh, it's a pretty good thumbnail sketch of 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 what uh, of what I found as well. Uh, thank you for uh, telling me telling us the story about your mom. That was very. Entertaining. Thank you for listening. It's a long one, but there you go. <laughs> well, that, that's the very short version of it. That's uh, I'd like to hear the long version from her. Mm. Uh, well, I, I don't know that I even got that. I certainly didn't. She would, you know, when she would say uh, more than she was supposed to, she would kind of look disgusted with herself. And then you wouldn't hear about it again for a long time. Um, I had one, you know, I, I, you kind of meet interesting people uh, being the state director for MUFON. And, you know, I know some people in officialdom and uh, one guy from the DOD. I've had two different guys from the DOD tell me that they've read my mom's file. Um, the one the one guy told me uh, your, your mom did not lie to you. You can feel really, really proud of what your mom did. She was a real patriot. You know, not just a flag waver, but she knew that there was a risk doing what she did. And uh, and and I told I I said to him, I said, well, can you tell me a little bit more? Can you read a bit more for me from her file? And he said, nope. He said your mom's file is is sealed. I can't. I can't. But but I I felt like I owed you that much. Your mom wasn't lying to you. She was telling you the truth. <laughs> so. Uh, go on and tell us your story uh, with your encounter. Sure. Well, um, again, you know, it, uh, what my mom said, this is realer than you will ever know. For some reason, that just kind of stuck in my craw. I, I just, uh, and I guess curiosity is not need to know, but I really, really wanted to know. I just had this personal need to understand um, and especially because my mom kept getting cancers. So that's the other thing. And they were unrelated. They weren't metastasized. Um, one doctor said that, well, it was like you were irradiated because she'd get cancer. You know, she she had a uh, had to have a hysterectomy at age 35, it's, you know, not long after I was born. Uh, she had to have, uh, you know, she was a double mastectomy survivor. She had had colon cancer. I mean, it just kept on popping up. And, and through my personal studies, and also I've spoken with Richard Souter, who's written about four or five different books on deep underground military bases. Uh, he said that a lot of the people that worked in those facilities had recurring cancers and, and, and terrible health problems. And it kind of goes along with this David Garish guy, that the, this whistleblower that's been coming out where he was saying that a lot of people, they, they, they had suffered physical harm, you know, the early people that were working in this field. Um, now, I don't know if my mom was working with, with uh, uh, UFO crash materials or if she was, you know, if, if they had, I mean, it was in the middle of the desert. I'm sure it was that they were not using the power. It, was, it had to have been offline. So I'm guessing it was probably an early nuclear pile uh, probably similar to the old, uh, the early, you know, Nautilus uh, submarines that we had, because uh, they were running a city off of something in the middle of nowhere. So, oh. it, it, I, but I don't think they protected their people, or they didn't know the the, the, the consequences of radiation and things like that. The pro one of the problems with Area Fifty One is that um, it's right next to. Uh, the location where Trinity and where they tested all the nuclear weapons is literally right next door. Yeah, so that radiation is could still have been in that. that in that immediate area. So if 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 she if the dome was under Area 51, then you know there are probably a lot of people that worked at Area 51 that were affected by the fact that those nuclear detonations were right next door. Plus. Um, 
Area 51, uh, I guess the uh, my, 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 my wife used to be friends with um, some wives of various generals and colonels and uh, almost, well, I think, not generals, colonels, full bird and, uh, uh, and non full bird colonels. And they, one of the ladies' husband had died from Area 51, and they had a class action suit against the government mm. that I think Clinton probably uh, stopped it or something. But they, what they did was they took uh, P9 experimental jet fuel and they used and they. They wouldn't let anything come off the base, and so mm. they would take all the the uh, stuff, the paperwork, and the furniture, and anything they didn't want on the base anymore. Since they couldn't remove stuff from the base, they just dug a bunch of trenches, put all the stuff in it, and and burned poured it. the experimental jet mm. fuel on top and burned it all. Yeah, and I've heard gave that. a lot of people cancer. It killed uh, this lady's husband who was part of that class section suit. And regarding your um, your uh, ball lightning friend, she's wrong. I've seen ball lightning. It's the most rare. It's more rare than alien encounters. And uh, it can be very persistent. Hmm. I've seen it persist for a considerable amount of time. But it is ball lightning, but it's, it's the rarest of the rare. And I've witnessed it. Hmm. I've never I've never come across a human besides myself who's witnessed it. Hmm. But uh, tell us the story. Well, Irina Scott, she's got a I, she's got a ball lightning story that's pretty interesting. She's she uh, she wrote the she's written a few books on the Pascagoula case. Um, another person from up in Ohio, and, and she used to work for the NSA. I, I believe she was working with the NSA, uh, but she had a, a UFO encounter where there was missing time and stuff. But uh, what I think is with with what my mom described, it seemed like it was under intelligent control. I mean, it went over to her sister, then it went over to her, and then it pushed its way back through the screen by the, the way it came in. So I, I sometimes wonder if perhaps she might have been perused by by our visitors. Uh, I know that family line, bloodlines are important to them for some reason. Uh, I, I just see with, with many, many uh, abduction and visitation cases, a lot of times it will be military or, or an officialdom background. A lot of military brats will come to me with their stories or, you know, soldiers that are, you know, I have one guy that was literally abducted through his barrack ceiling at uh, Camp Pendleton. Uh, this was back in the 1960s. The guy still has PTSD. But uh, speaking with his wife and his kids, because uh, I interviewed the whole family, they said, well, dad's been talking about this all of his life, and he still has nerves from it. it, it he has PTSD, but he says that it's from his, uh, his experience and not from the war itself. So, uh, But anyway, I think that perhaps my mom, and I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe it was just ball lightning. I don't know. Well, that, you know you're getting... You're, okay. <laughs> First of all, I'm not a skeptic, so yeah. I'm an experiencer myself. So I'm not uh, okay. uh, in any way skeptical of anything you're saying. I'm not saying mm. it was ball lightning. I'm just saying I've had, in addition to being an experiencer, I've also seen ball lightning. That's cool. Not, I'm not replacing one phenomenon with the other. Ball lightning, <laughs> here's the thing. Your mom's experience could not have been ball lightning. And mm. the reason why it could not have been ball lightning it's because ball lightning would have fried her at that yeah. distance. I think it would. I don't think it would have pushed through the screen and porch. I did. It, it probably would have hit that an electric. It would have been like an electric fence. Is what probably would have happened. But uh, this re retained its form. She said it was. It was a weird story. I mean, this was one. You know, I mean, the UFO thing and and the deep underground military base. That she didn't even tell my sister. Uh, you know, I, 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 my sister and I aren't that close. 
But uh, at, at another relative's funeral uh, a few years back, I asked her, you know, did mom ever tell you about, you know, working in the deep underground uh, facility that she was in? And my sister had never heard of it. Uh, and I think my mom kind of learned her lesson. She thought that she could. She told me later on, she said, son, I wouldn't have ever told you what I told you, because, except that I thought you, would, you were young enough to forget. Uh, but to her horror, I kept bringing it up. And uh, she just usually wouldn't talk about it if she'd had maybe, you know, if she'd had a martini. She wasn't a big drinker, you know. If she, if she was relaxed and had a martini or something, then she might start talking a little bit more. And, and believe me, I tried to get her to talk more. Um, but when she passed away, there was that that ended my line of information. Um, not only was I heartbroken because I was very, very close to my mom. Um, the other thing that's weird is, is that she was pregnant with me when she was working in, in the facility. She said, uh, well, you were down there too, Earl, technically. And I said, well, what do you mean? And this was when I was like 21 and I was trying to get her to talk more. And she got disgusted, walked out of the room, and then she came back, you know, with kind of a you know, raised eyebrow and a little grin. And she said, well, you were down there too. Uh, but, but I was pregnant with you, you know? <laughs> so now I have not had cancers and stuff. So I, I don't know if, you know, I was protected by the, you know, amniotic fluid or what, but, uh, as, as it hasn't been my problem, but, um, well, anyway, getting to my own personal experience, cause that's really the only thing that I can talk, that's experiential, you know. Um, I, I had read a few things like Bud Hopkins. I'd read, you know, the early, uh, like the stuff that happened over at Giant Rock and, and all that, the contactee movement stuff. I, I wasn't sure what I, what I really felt about everything, but I really wanted to know. Uh, and I, I think in the back of my mind, I was hoping I would meet the tall Nordic types or, you know, somebody that was more like, like us and, and would communicate with me. So I started, uh, I, I used to meditate when I was younger and I, I took up meditation again and I did it with a CE5, uh, kind of thing where I was sending out a message. Uh, I didn't designate where I wanted it to go. It was just kind of going out to, you know, hey, aliens, you know, <laughs> space people, where whoever you are, wherever you are. Uh, what I sent out was was that uh, if you want, you can abduct me. You can you can have my DNA. I just want to meet you. I, I want to meet you. I, I want to see a, a, a UFO with my own eyes. Um, which I did later on. It didn't happen. I mean, I got a, a visit is what happened to me. Um, and I tried this for a couple of weeks. I didn't really take it that seriously. I didn't I tell you the truth. I didn't think it was going to work, but it was worth a shot. Right. And very naive. Uh, anybody out there, don't do that. <laughs> don't offer yourself up as a abductee. It's not a good idea. Uh, you know, we, yes, we do have space brothers out there, but they're not all space brothers. You know, some of them, uh, I don't know if they're so much malevolent as uh, look at us more like, like we would look at the animal kingdom, you know. Uh, but anyway, I, I, at this point, I had been a MUFON field investigator for maybe four months, maybe a little longer than that. I had a, like maybe 15 cases under my belt. Um, I don't think I even had an unknown yet. They'd all been kind of prosaic objects, but there, there were a couple that were interesting. Uh, and I was kind of feeling my oats. I went upstairs. We were living in Burbank, California. This was not in a rural area. Okay, my wife still works over at Warner Brothers Studios. That, that's, her, that's her day gig. Um, I, I was working as a nurse. I just retired after a 40-year nursing career. Arthritis, finally, <laughs> kind of closed the door on that. Uh, I couldn't do what I'm doing right now, though, if I was still working 12-hour nursing shifts. But anyway, I went upstairs after closing a case. It was a little after midnight. Uh, I was putting a bunch of pillows behind my back because that's the way I like to sleep, you know, kind of in a semi-recumbent position. And I noticed something 
very strange. Sounds outside of our house started getting quieter. And there seemed to be this light that was growing in our room. And what, looking back on it, it you know, I, I'm kind of a scientifically, I am a scientifically minded guy. Uh, but I, I wasn't really questioning it. It seemed like it was calming me. It had sort of like this bluish, I don't know so much that it was a bluish tinge, but it felt like the color blue to me. And the light got brighter and it didn't, it wasn't coming from a source. It was almost like the way that a mist will roll in or something. Uh, and that's not the way photons work. You have to flip a switch, you know, and then the photons go and you've got light. But this seemed different. Um, but I was getting calmer and calmer, the brighter that our room got. Uh, my wife, who's usually a very light sleeper, was dead to the world. You know, she she was not waking up. Uh, normally, we had crickets in the rafters. You could not hear crickets. You could not hear car sounds. It's almost like there was this little bubble that that surrounded our 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 room. And I noticed that in front of me, in front of the bed, that there was an area that was getting brighter and brighter. And it started taking a shape. And it looked like almost like this swirling, like a, it was sepia, yellowish, tan colored. Uh, that was this spinning. Area. And it was where in front of the TV set where it usually was. Uh, what happened was impossible, but it happened. Uh, I could not move, couldn't move my fingers, my toes, just could move my eyes. And I, that started scaring me because I used to take care of quadriplegics. That was, that was my gig, you know, as a, a ventilator certified nurse for many, many years. Um, how I ruined my back, <laughs> it's lifting these people, you know, but I loved doing that. But suddenly I, you know, want to ever be, that was the last thing I'd ever want to be is, 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 is a, a quadriplegic. And suddenly I was, I could not move a muscle. And uh, it seemed like somebody poured cream into a cup of coffee, the way that this thing in front of our bed opened up. Uh, it was a hole in space. It opened to about seven feet across. Uh, it wasn't perfectly symmetrical. It was almost kind of cloudy on the edges, the way that it looked. And uh, at this point, uh, I felt almost as though I was in a sort of half-awake, half-dream-like state. Hypnagogic state, I think, is the, the term for it. Uh, I was still very calm, but uh, I saw these four figures that were drawing towards me. Um, just, you couldn't see anything but light, but there was distance in this hole that was in, in our wall for lack of better. I mean, I usually just say it was a portal and that's probably what it was. They drew up, they didn't walk up. It was like, almost like somebody pulled them up to, to where I was at and they were staring at me and it was the big black eyes that took up a good quarter of their faces uh, four foot tall, it was the little gray guys. I couldn't see clothes on them. They seemed sexless to me. And uh, they started taking blood from me. Uh, they put, attached tubes to the top of my chest. It looked almost like the big fire hoses that you see the fire trucks have. They weren't like a garden hose or something. There was maybe, I don't know, three two and a half inches, three inches across, one per side. And this is when I started being afraid, is that they were not communicating with me. And I was feeling very, very weak. Um, I was praying. Uh, I was begging for them to stop because I wasn't getting a telepathic message. I'd, I'd read enough literature about this that I, I knew that usually there would be a tall guy standing there that would be telepathic and would tell you it's going to be okay. They're not going to harm you. We're going to leave, you know, you're, you're going to be okay after all this. And I wasn't getting that. Um, but it was about 15 minutes of this it, it, and they worked like a surgical team. Uh, there w didn't seem like there was a move that was wasted. One per, you know, the one 
creature would do something with his hands and the other one would 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 it was almost like everything was scripted out there i didn't see any communication between them uh the mouths were like a slit the nose was like a a newborn's nose it was just like an afterthought but there you can't not look into those eyes I, i'm not sure who who you met mike but but i know with these guys there was something about the eyes that you just could not look away and that was a weird thing is i could look away i, I and i i don't know that i even wanted to, to look in their eyes <laughs> but i couldn't stop but they pulled away the same way that they came in and one thing I failed to mention was that there was a taller creature that was almost, it was looked like he was standing guard and I could see his silhouette. He stood there like at the periphery of, of the, the portal that they'd opened up, but he kept standing there. He never really moved. Um, but they moved backwards. So they kept looking at me. They didn't walk away. Uh, but they pulled away again, almost like somebody like they were on a rug and somebody was pulling them back. Uh, the 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 wall again reformed uh, uh, the the I mean this it looked like a galaxy before it opened up you know this spinning bright area well it was it was almost like in reverse uh, it, the the brightness left it went to the little center dot of of light and then it was dark in the room again I still couldn't move. It took about, well, it seemed like five minutes. It might have been less time. Uh, room still lit up. Uh, as soon as I could move, I started yelling and screaming and shaking my wife and yelling about ETs, and, and she was not happy with me. Uh, her reaction was, was, oh, my God, you joined this crazy UFO group. Is this what I have to look forward to? And, <laughs> and, and you know, I think that she thought that I'd had a, a mental collapse or I, I don't know what she thought. I mean, I don't have a history of mental problems, but, you know, she how else do you describe that? Um, and it was to the point where, well, I felt like I couldn't talk about it. She didn't bring it up the next day. She was, it was like it hadn't happened. Like I hadn't been screaming and yelling to where the neighbors could hear me and shaking her. Um, but, you know, she two nights after my experience, uh, my wife has shaken me. She's shaken me awake. And I've never seen her do this before. <laughs> she was literally she was pacing beside the bed. Again, our room was filled with light, with no source. There's no lights on. It wasn't somebody's iPhone, you know, laying the business side up or, you know. But the room is flooded with light again. And my wife said, oh, my God. She said, you need to tell your little friends that they need to leave us. <laughs> She's a pretty bad word, the bad word, uh, the F alone. I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> and I, half of me was horrified that my wife had gone through this. But you know what, Mike, the other, the other half of me, and maybe it was wrong, at least I felt relieved because at least Lisa knew that I wasn't crazy, that I hadn't had some kind of mental break. Uh, she went through the same sort of thing. Um, again, we didn't talk about it the next two days. But two days later, we both woke up, light in our room. This time we could both move. There was no spinning galaxy thing in front of the bed. The TV set was there, except that there was light also coming from outside of our house and it was coming from above. So we ran to the window. I was on the right side and she was on the left. And I, we had like the, these guys, the, the blinds, you know? So I pulled up the Venetian blinds and the light is, is coming down from our roof of our house, like God's own spotlight. Uh, I've never seen such, I mean, you could see every little leaf in our backyard was just, the, the shadows were set off by this. And you could see neighbor porch lights turning on down the block. So apparently other people could see this too. Uh, no sound of rotors, nothing like that. Uh, it was perfectly silent. 
again and and you couldn't hear the external sounds again which is i guess they call that the oz effect where time becomes weird sounds become muffled um but lisa and i were looking at each other and this thought comes into our heads at the exact same time it was like a voice it was a telepathic voice and I guess that our visitors were trying to give us something prosaic to blame this on. Don't worry, it's just the neighbor's porch light. And we looked at each other and it was just so absurd that we started laughing. And Lisa and I both said at the same time, that's not a porch light. Um, and, you know, that was, the, that was our weird week. Now, this happened about eight years ago. Um, I, I was very confused. I mean, I told my state director about this. I There were two people I told about, told this to. Um, one was Peter Robbins. Peter was helpful, right? But he didn't know me that well. He didn't know me that well yet. Uh, but my state director, uh, Jeff, he, he was kind of a nuts and bolts guy. Very, very good nuts and bolts ufologist, but he didn't really have a lot of room for for the abduction thing, you know. He he thought that it was very rare if it happened at all. And here's his new field investigator saying that I, I've seen ETs uh, face to face. He he was not happy about it. I thought he might even fire me for MUFON or something. Uh, later on, Jeff had his own experience, and now he knows he knows this is a very, very strange, strange phenomenon. But uh, I really didn't know what I noticed after this experience was I noticed, even though it was, it was scary to me initially, uh, my empathy was kicked up through the rafters. I could feel people's feelings, like if somebody was hurt or confused or upset or, or joyous. I mean, it was I, I could share that somehow. Uh, intuition levels went through the roof. I became very good at connecting the dots with cases. I, I would see markers in one case, and then suddenly I'd remember another case from six, seven months before and, and realize, oh, this is like the same thing going on here, you know. Um, it seems like it gave me a propensity to understand the phenomenon. Uh, now I know that, you know, they, I guess that Kenneth Ring talked about this back in 91 in a book he wrote. Uh, and, and Dr. Jacques Vallée and Eric Davis, uh, they kind of penned, they, they mentioned this, they, they call it the Vallée-Davis effect where people who have had encounters with uh, anomalous beings you start uh, manifesting gifts, I guess is the word, that we usually attribute to our visitors themselves. Synchronicity is, is I mean, it's just like these little miraculous, meaningful coincidences that seem to follow my life. It's been very, very helpful in uh, in my work with, with experiencers and, and in ufology in general too. Um, but anyway, I, I was kind of on my own with all this for a long time, but Kathleen Marden, she does, you know, I, I used to send experiencer cases to her to kind of follow up and possibly hypnotically regress people if they had a burning desire for that. Uh, well, we met for lunch. Uh, this is about five, uh, six years ago, almost, um, and and we met for lunch and, and and I I told her what happened with me and I kind of knew her already but but this was the first time I'd spent any time with Kathleen and uh, afterwards Kathy told me that perhaps I would like to join uh, Mufon's ERT at that time it was called the Experiencer Research Team we've kind of rebranded it it wasn't really an accurate term we're more it's more resource uh, oriented. Um, we work almost like uh, social workers for experiencers is the way that the ERT works. It's MUFON's, uh, I guess, MUFON's uh, empathetic arm, you know, not so much about research as it is helping these people who are oftentimes confused. Um, and, you know, some people have a, have beautiful experiences. I mean, I, I, I know one guy who met 
uh, tall Nordics in the middle of a national park uh, saw a craft come down and he felt this great love from them. Uh, with me, it was more like the, the, the Buddhist monk that whacks you on the back of the, you know, on your back with a, the blunt end of a sword. I think that it was a wake up call. Uh, I think that I was naive about it and it was saying, you know, what I was being told was um, you're, you're looking at this in the wrong way. You want to see a hot rod spaceship. That's, that's not what this is about. You know, you want to meet, you know, space brothers and that's all good and fine, but you need to learn how to become a space brother yourself. Um, and it, it, I feel like it, it, but that was sort of, that was a flashpoint was when I had my face-to-face -face experience. It changed my life, changed my life. Uh, holy moly, my light uh, just went away. So let, me, <laughs> let me give myself some more light. There we go. Let's let see. there be light. <laughs> so what was, so your experience that you had, was it, do you see any parallels? with what i mean people's experiences run the gamut that's the one thing i've found you know uh, uh my experiences are nothing like yours and mm. um as you must know with all the 78 or some odd experiences that you've taken from people that are beyond explanation uh, you must know by now that there are many different, many, many, many different types of experiences. In your bio, it states that you're um, focused around the more strange experiences. Well, um, one of my experiences was the, the being was invisible. I didn't see mm. it. It made a weird sound. I intuitively knew it was present. And I went through it like it was a portal. Uh, into like just mentally I went through it um, and it was like on uh, Star Trek where you where they go into warp with all the stars go flying by cool. uh, I saw something <laughs> like that in my head when I wow. went through this thing but it wasn't I, I assume it wasn't allowed to take me where it wanted to take me because it didn't last very long that was one of them, and then another one was. Um, you're familiar with the Free Report, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Renario Hernandez, de dear friend, actually. Okay, so um, most people talk about, like you, they talk about Greys, Mantids, uh, Nordics, and uh, Blues, and uh, you know a few others, and. Uh, but very few people talk about the most common, the two most common uh, beings mentioned in the free report are rarely talked about by people, which is really odd because they're the most seen, but the, the ones that nobody talks about. And one of them is, uh, it's like Space Brothers, except it's not special. Space Brothers, you know, you, you listen to people's stories about them and they're very uh, uniform, as in they're beautiful. They, you know, they're the men are hot, the women are gorgeous, and so on and so forth. But um, the free report says one of the two most experienced ones are just normal humans, like yeah. like you'd walk among us and you wouldn't know they were aliens. I but agree. That, yeah. Yeah. That, that's what I, I I'm saw. sure I've met them too. <laughs> I well, know I have. That, that's what I yeah. saw, but it's. Hmm. You wouldn't, it, had I not experienced the way they came and the way they left, which is impossible, uh, I would never have known they were alien to begin with because they looked just like anybody else. So uh, anyway, that's what I experienced in the short without going through the details. But hmm. um, I'm not really here to hear me. I want to hear... <laughs> uh, I I more on time. I went. I wanted to break it up a little bit. Plus, I, you know, you mentioned your experiencer, so I, I that always piques my interest. Like I, you know, I guess I, I don't know. I've been doing this for a while now, and you'd think I'd be tired of it, but I, I, 
I'm I'm constantly learning stuff from people, you know. As soon as I think I've heard it all, you know, I hear something else. So Well, my um aside from my alien encounters, my the book 90 I'd say 95% of my experiences are paranormal. Hmm. I'm I'm not an expert in aliens. I've had uh I've had maybe two, three uh, alien encounters in my whole life. I think maybe two, uh, for sure. And but with craft, I've had you know maybe half a dozen or more experiences with the craft. And one mm-hmm. of those with the, was with a bunch of people around who also saw it, not just me. Mm-hmm. And uh, but the bulk of my experiences, ninety five percent, are paranormal, and mm-hmm. they are just as weird, if not considerably weirder, than alien encounters when you uh when you start getting into demons and uh things that um people don't generally talk about too much or maybe they do they just don't mix them with aliens you know you're either talking aliens or you're talking something else but you rarely hear anybody talk both together in the same Hmm. uh, conversation so my uh, I've had two attaching spirits attached to my body, mm. uh, both demonic, uh, since I was 16. And um, so most people don't believe in attaching spirits, but if you've had to live with them moment by moment your whole life, then and you've had other people around you see them, my deal is that I don't just believe in them because I experienced them, but I've uh, run into a number of people who've seen my attaching spirits. Mm. And, uh, one woman who saw the one sitting on my head, one fellow I was in jail with who saw the one sitting on my back. And then I've also gone through half a dozen experiences where I've seen other people's attaching spirits. One, I've only actually seen one other person's attaching spirit. Mm. Uh, that was, a, I think, was a gin, not a demon. But it was as mm. scary as a demon. It was very uh it scared the crap out of me but um but i have been in about half a dozen uh, um, experiences within a uh, like a, a very short amount of time where i saw uh people's symptoms i wasn't seeing hmm. their actual attaching spirits i was seeing uh, symptoms in them that gave me the understanding that they had attaching spirits. And mm. what I was seeing was their, um, like their, their astral body, their causal body, their mental body, their thick body, one of the other non-physical bodies that they have. I was seeing that, but to me it looked like their physical body, but I knew it wasn't their physical body. It, it looked like their physical body to me, but I, I just logically could deduce it wasn't it couldn't possibly be their physical body. And what I was seeing was their eyes were moving around really fast in their in their in their you know in their eyes. Their mm. eyes were like jumping around really quick. And I knew uh, intuitively when I was seeing that that they had an attaching spirit. And sometime one of those experiences was just a little girl, it was like five year old girl who six year old or younger, uh, four to six. Um, She was by herself, and then others were, there was one, the scariest one I had was, uh, I was walking down the street, and everybody had that, their head, their eyes jumping around. It was 100% of all the people. Hmm. And that was kind of scary, because you, like, you wonder where you're at, if you, for every single person you encounter, as attaching spirits that are, you know, not mm. friendly, you wonder where you're at, you know. Yeah. You kind of start getting uh, a little paranoid about the whole situation. Anyway, uh, back to you. So let's... Um, well, do you know, have, have you ever met Paul Eno? Or or he's an interesting guy. And he's... I, he's, have, uh, I used to listen to his him and his father's... Uh, what's his father's name? Ben. Uh, well, I I know. Yeah, Ben is the son, and and Paul oh. is the father. Oh, okay, actually. okay, I got it. Yeah, back. Pa- I work with Paul. Actually, he's he's a member of the ERT as well. 
but he he handles a lot of the more you know demonic oppression things and attachment stuff. I mean, I know that stuff is real. Uh, it's it scares me, uh, but it, I think it's different than people. It's it's more complex than people think. I mean, I grew up with a Christian background. I still consider myself a Christian. I mean, I took uh, you know pre seminary classes uh, when I was young. Um, but I've, I've thrown out a lot of bath water. I've sort of retained the baby and thrown out a lot of bath water because I think the Christian church is not acting very much in accord with, with the words of, of their leader, you know, uh, anymore. It's sort of become, you know, politicized and, and, and nasty. But I, I feel like uh, in my own work, I've come across things that I would call evil or, or scary, but I don't feel afraid because I've, I kind of know how to protect myself. Um, uh, I still do call on, on God and, and, and I, I feel like God does live in me. Uh, but I do, uh, I do use certain things that are more, I guess, more common in paganism and stuff like that. Whereas I'll, I'll ground and center myself. I'll, 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 you know, take up the earth energies and create uh, a, a bubble of protection around myself. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I haven't had that many situations where I felt compelled, where I was really scared to where I, which is different. You know, I think when I was younger, uh, I was pretty darn scared of stuff like that. For some reason, the paranormal, um, one of my old girlfriends, she had uh, poltergeist activity in her house, and I, I witnessed it for, firsthand. You know, I mean, I saw a painting fly seven feet across the room and land face down, and uh, you know, objects in the other room. But what, later on, I found out that she was a uh, uh, she was had missing time from when she was a little girl. She had seen a craft in in the sky. And uh, the next thing she knew, it was about an hour later, and family was looking for her. And um, so I'm not sure if if time. This was in the the 1990s, and I, I wasn't familiar with the the experiencer phenomena. I mean, a lot of times, experiencers will have guys' activity happen around them. It energizes something, you know, that we don't stand up. Um, I know, you know, I was mentioning uh, Dr. Irina Scott earlier. I mean, after she and her sister had their close encounter with a craft and she had had missing time, uh, she got home and her electric toothbrush flew across the bathroom and hit the wall. I mean, that that is pure poltergeist activity. But it was uh, it was it was only experienced after she had had missing time after seeing a UFO. Um, so I, I, I think that I kind of think, you know, I love Jacques Vallée. I love the way that he thinks he seems to have more of a mystical approach to this stuff. And I, I kind of try to, you know, walk a tightrope between being scientific and then knowing that this is beyond our science's ability to understand, uh, this phenomenon. But well, we're not with with Ray Hernandez in the free group. I mean, he feels like these are all uh, contact modalities anyway. That, that it's all part of the same wheel. Uh, they're just different spokes, you know, leading from the same hub, and different manifestations. That it's this other that's that's here that shares this world with us. Uh, I'm more of a dimensionalist than a, a, a you know I don't. The, the extraterrestrial hypothesis where they're coming from other star systems, I think that some of that is in play, but I think mostly it's it's a dimensional visitation that, that, that we're mostly experiencing. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I just, it seems to make more sense to me. I used to listen to uh, Paul and uh, Eno's show where he talked about all, a lot of his experiences and things and... Um, the guy who wrote the Mothman prophecies, what was his name? What, what, what was it? The guy who wrote the Mothman prophecies. Oh, right, right. John Keel, are we talking? No, John it was John Keeler. Oh, okay. uh, uh, John. I know you're talking about. You know who I'm I talking can't... about. Yeah, it's brain, brain fart here. Anyway, he, uh, 
he connected the he said that he had interviewed more uh, contactees than anybody ever who's ever lived and and then he connected uh, he said that if you've seen something in the sky then you're likely to have paranormal stuff happen in your house he connected hmm. uh, the uh, experiencer or the ets with the paranormal before anybody else did hmm. uh, john keel yeah john keel is an interesting guy <laughs> yeah I, I like john keel I, I love the mothman prophecies i loved uh, uh you know he, you know, yeah, Trojan horse theory was pretty interesting. You, you uh, realize he left a lot of the, the story out, right? He, the With the Mothman prophecies, I mean, both the movie and the book. Uh, the movie is, you know, close to the book, but the book leaves a lot of the story out. He, um, The aliens came to that, that city where the bridge collapsed before the Mothman did. They had, uh, mm. you, have you heard the uh, the guy, there's there's one on YouTube that's still around that was a recording, an audio recording of the guy who had, he was driving down the highway and the alien craft, it was like a floating car, UFO thing. It came up behind him, it went around him it went in front of him, it turned sideways, slowed down, and forced him to a stop. And then it opened the door on the side. The alien got out, walked around to the side of the, his car, and knocked on the window. Did you, have you heard that one? I don't think I've heard that, but I yeah, like it. It's still I like on it. YouTube. It's still on huh. YouTube. And that event occurred before Mothman was ever seen hmm. in the same area. In the same area. So that, 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 is a precursor to when the bridge fell and people were seeing the manifestation of this flying moth creature and all that. Yeah, so this was alien before, first, before huh? any of that. Yeah, this was before <laughs> well, that's, any of that. That's interesting. But it was like immediately before. Hmm. So the alien showed up first, then the mothman showed up. Huh. So it was once again the aliens first and then the paranormal second. That. So, I, I see the connection, and uh, you know, Mufon. I'll I'll be honest with you. They they just really want to get away from the paranormal stuff, but uh, it's a symptom. I mean, it seems like it's hand in hand along with it. it it's something else. What what I've the way that I see this phenomenon is is that it seems like their signature is almost like intentional absurdity. With every single the very best cases seems to be something in there that you're going to feel embarrassed about almost. Uh, you know, and it kind of goes back to Jacques Vallée's Magonia stuff, you know. Uh, but I, I I don't believe that this is a new phenomenon. I think this is the way it manifests for us, for our mindset. Uh, in the 1950s, it, it manifested as nuts and bolts craft, you know. Uh, 1800s, people were seeing the, the you know, the airship. Like you're at a Verne. And, you know, you just keep going back in history. The Romans had their flying shields. It, it, it just, you know, there's always been this other that's been here along with us. And I, I think that it's probably, I mean, I, obvious. I mean, it's, it's, it's where myth and, and, and our great stories and, and maybe the, a lot of Campbell stuff that he even mentions. And it, it, it's deeply ingrained with us you know um cameron uh what's his name the, the guy that the apunia do you have you heard i guess you've heard the story where the the uh, the ufo group you might call it a cult or not depending on who you are where they go out and ask the ets to show up and they have a with a little laser pointers and stuff no no mean? no i'm not talking no. about that no, oh, this okay. isn't a c5 thing no, I'm talking about the um, the Grant Cameron. I think was the first oh, Grant. Person brought up. Yeah, he he uh, actually filmed one where th you could see the the uh, the formation. It's like a cloud formation over the water that he filmed, and then uh, when they call him over the land, the uh, aliens show up, and they're it's like a portal into another world. 
Yeah. And I forgot well, what they I've seen it. that. So I know Have that's you? real. Yeah. Well, I saw well, I mean, yeah, they the opened room, up a portal room, yeah. into my room, you know. Yeah. Well, this is thing. What I'm talking about is big. It's like I have a, a friend t- in the UK who got a, an amazing video and photographs of what's technically a flying saucer. Uh, it starts as a, as a spindle and it shape shifts into an inverted bowl with a little cupola on top, right? Your classic flying saucer shape. Uh, you see behind it what looks like this black cloud, but it wasn't a black cloud. It was a perfectly blue sky. Well, the saucer moves right into this black area and it closes up around it and it's all blue sky and no no flying saucer anymore. Uh, same thing off of Seal Beach here. Uh, Kevin Day is a friend uh, that, you know, Caroline Corey did her film uh, Terror in the Sky. Uh, you know, out of pocket, she brought all these scientists who weren't involved with UFOs or any of that stuff, but with monitoring equipment, and they, they watched a portal open up. It emitted gra- gamma rays, uh, which the only thing that I know of that can emit a gamma ray is a black hole, a neutron star, you know. Uh, those are the only two things we know of that can emit gamma rays. But yet gamma rays were coming out. The scientists were all gobsmacked. They couldn't believe what was on their monitoring equipment and what they were seeing with their own eyes. Um, so I know that they use portal technology to get around. It, it kind of explains why NORAD doesn't see, you know, a spaceship coming from the edge of the solar system coming closer to us. And then suddenly everybody has a UFO reports coming in. They seem to appear and disappear. Well, the reason that tells why, me that it's dimensional, you know. The reason why I brought up the Punia is, is because um, with the aliens, when the aliens showed up, the elves were with them. Mm-hmm. And you don't hear too many alien encounters where the elves show up with the aliens. And Hopkinsville, that, that's a good one. They're the, the little gremlin guys. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, my, and I love that case. It's it's beautiful case. It's got the dirty signature on it. You know, uh, I mean, I've got one case out here where this woman, uh, she was born with this lung condition. Uh, she was supposed to die. I mean, she they they believed that you know she wouldn't live past puberty, and she and her brother saw these spherical, I guess you'd call them orbs, right? Flash of light in the backyard. A uh, father worked in a national park. They were a very rural area, but there they open the curtain and they see these balls of light dancing around. And then they came up closer to the window and they had little smiley faces. I mean, they became like smiley faces for these two children. Uh, I imagine so they wouldn't scare them, perhaps. But uh, the next night, the same thing in the light you know flash of light in this forested area i mean they lived in a forest uh, up near i guess the big bear area here and again these they wanted to see these happy faces well one came right up to the screen and she she got out of bed and she kind of dragged herself up you know to the screen and she's looking at this thing and it turned into the your proverbial black-eyed gray alien they saw you know uh, the next thing that she remembers is she wakes up in the morning, she's back in bed, and she has this, like, mask on her face, this mask of gunk. And apparently, this stuff came up from her lungs, and it literally dried on her face. Her mom came out, had to do hot compresses on her face uh, to get it off. Uh, the mom's doing this. The girl is really upset. You know, she couldn't breathe through her nose. It was covered up with dried up snot, more or less. Uh, sorry if I'm rude, but that's what it was. Exudate is what we call it in the nursing world. Um, the mom started noticing something weird that her daughter's lungs were perfectly clear. First time ever. First time ever in her entire life. Uh, went to the doctor and and he, she was absolutely fine and and I this woman you know I I she she uh, got a hold of me through Mufon and uh, I, I I very emotional telling her story but as far as I know she was healed by these these entities 
um, <laughs> that, that it was kind of the proverbial orb. And then it turns into a silly, like the dumb, have a nice day, smiley face that you saw everywhere in the 1970s. And then it's a gray alien. I mean, for me, it's got the absurdity marker to it. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. It'd be even kind of embarrassing to tell the story to a scientist or somebody. But uh, I, I, it, it's, it sort of has a sweetness to it, this weirdness to it. And here this woman is, she's now in her late 50s and her lungs are fine. You know, she's gone and lived a perfectly normal life. Wasn't supposed to live past puberty. So, well, <laughs> my my claim to fame, as far as all of my experiences, the one that uh, stands out in my side is, uh, and I'll only mention this once really quick because, again, I'm here to hear your story, but I was on... Uh, Cape Canaveral before the first space shuttle launch, and I had a strong feeling to tell the people I was with about my first close encounter, and that story takes 30 minutes or more to tell. And so I told them the story, and um, the minute, the second I finished telling the story, I spit the last word out, and the uh, German kid in the front seat passenger laughed at me. I, he didn't believe my story. So I, I said in my mind, I said, God, I wish you would show them what I saw. And within one to three seconds, I got my wish. And they're on uh, Cape Canaveral Base uh, out in front of the car was a craft looking exactly like the first one I saw. Wow. And it was a black hole with eight equidistant lights on the edge. Hmm. And we went under this thing and uh, the kids beside me two kids to my left and one behind me, the, thing, the, the moment this thing appeared, they were totally frozen. They couldn't move. Not, they didn't move a muscle, not even their eyes. And they were totally frozen the whole time the craft was uh, there. And the adults sitting in the front seat, the driver, the father, and, uh, the, and his, uh, I guess his worker, the worker said to him, maybe that's what he saw. And the father said, well, yeah, maybe that is what he saw. So they acknowledged its presence. Mm-hmm. And then from that moment forward, they didn't care. They had, they had no, uh, no, um, they never looked up at it. They weren't staring mm-hmm. at it. They didn't have any intense interest in it. They didn't. Yeah. They it, didn't was for, it wasn't for them. It was, it was for that kid's eyes only, maybe. It wasn't well, for them. The, kid, the kids weren't just allowed to see it. Close-minded, huh? Oh. Uh, the kids, the, the young kids, the two to my left and one behind me, the young kids were not allowed to see it. Their brains were turned off. They were frozen. The adults both saw it. The, the kid, he was like 20 to 23-ish, 18 to 23. He saw it. The father saw it. They both saw it. They acknowledged it verbally, and then they didn't care. For that, from that moment forward, they didn't care. And when we drove under this thing, I literally, if it, none of the cars stopped. Hundreds of cars drove directly under this thing. It was directly over the co- huh. causeway road, about 30 foot off the ground. It was bigger than the road itself. Not a single car stopped. And had we stopped and gotten out, I could have thrown a rock and hit it. It was that close. Hmm. So all the NASA scientists and their families who drove under this thing all saw it. But nobody cared enough mentally to stop. <laughs> I love it. Look. That's so, so proverbial. Uh, that's like a proverbial high strangeness uh, scenario. Well, uh, I, I've heard so many stories like that. And I I mean, when I had my craft sighting, I wasn't under my own mental cognition. The closer I got to it, the I didn't do anything I'm supposed to do or was ever trained to do. I didn't take photos, didn't take video. <laughs> I didn't even stop. I mean, suddenly the most important thing in the world was not being late to work, and I hated that job. <laughs> but uh, I, I drove right past this miracle, and 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 when I was out of its, I guess, realm of influence, I came to. I mean, this was an early morning sighting. It was a daytime sighting. It was six thirty in the morning. Um, but when you when you have an experience like that, what I've noticed is. 
seeing a craft. They're not, they're not here to do air shows. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's an experience. It's to change a person, I think, or or it's just uh, I don't know. It's just this profundity around it. But uh, I've I've had two different situations where I've seen craft since I had my my face to face thing had. And I never, I didn't do the right things that I was trained to do. People wonder why you don't see better photos or videos now that everybody's got a phone in their pocket, you know. But when you're close to a craft, close enough to get, you know, photos and stuff, it's the same thing as when you're face to face with an entity. You, you uh, you're kind of under their their power. At least that's the way it it was for me. And what you're talking about about how the they were seeing this miracle but they didn't care <laughs> yeah you know i mean that sounds very uh very much like this phenomenon it's, it's it's such a strange phenomenon and people do not act like themselves when they have experiences well i had a camera with me but i had very few frames left and no money i had like i had literally twenty dollars to my name and i had to get all the way back to houston without you know, with one fill up of gas and on a motorcycle. So I was really surprised I made it all back all the way back to Houston without running out of gas. <laughs> Having no money, no more money. Yeah. And I didn't have a credit card back then, you know, so I had a choice between taking that photo of that craft and the photo of the space show. And my photo of the space show to won the Houston Chronicle Kodak contest. Really? But it's never been seen by the public. Huh. It was disqualified for being like one day too old. It was, instead of being six months old, it was like six months and one day oh, beyond. So it, really? technically, it was like one day too old. You know, it was like this, yeah, I'd love to see the photo. You, you, you ought to text that over to me or something. I, um, I used to take my son out to the, you know, over to Edwards to watch the shuttle land. You know, that was like our kind of bonding stuff in the early eighties. Um, and uh, I love that. Uh, my my son had a really cool grammar school teacher that she was apparently connected, but she got us on the to the Edwards open house. The open house they had a shuttle landing, and then they had the open house. So we got to see the F one seventeen come in and take a landing. This is like nineteen ninety one. Uh, got to see uh, the SR seventy. Two is it? You know the Blackbird. They they landed that thing. Talk about Buck Rogers. It was this low whine that you could hear, and, and and like people are turning around. What is that? You know, we'd already seen the shuttle land, and this giant black, you know, technically a spaceship just lands there. And then Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier for us, and then he was signing autographs and stuff. But I I, I loved the space shuttle and everything around it. And, and uh, I'd love to see your photo. I'm sorry you didn't win the the, the prize. That's, that's well, pretty lousy. <laughs> you'll see it on my book, on the cover of my book, if I ever publish my book that I've written about my uh, alien encounters and the demons and everything else. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I finished it a while back, but I don't know that I'll ever find a publisher for it. So mm -hmm. you may or may not see the photo. If, if uh, if the book gets published, you'll see the photo. If not, you probably won't. But uh, I, do you have uh, being as your whole um, time with MUFON has been focused around the um, high strangeness events? Do you have any of those you want to share before we go? Sure. Well, I've I've shared a couple, but the I mean I consider the. The, the orbs that turned into happy faces and then a, turned into a gray alien and, and healed that woman, that's pretty high strangeness. Uh, I mentioned the one guy. Uh, I could tell you a little bit more about this this Marine that was, uh, that, that was abducted through the roof of Camp Pendleton, uh, his barracks. Uh, he had been out earlier that night, and this is back like 1968. And he said he'd been at a party, and somebody brought a Ouija board and it made him feel uncomfortable. He'd, he'd grown up you know, around the Bible, kind of like I did, you know. And that the Ouija board's a big no-no in that that culture. 
So we left the party early. He was, and this guy was a motor. He had kind of a classic 1950s hot rod that he drove around that he spent a lot of time on and po- kept polished, perfect shape, you know, a muscle car. And he's driving home and he sees this bright flash uh, off the road. And along with that flash, there's like Tesla coil, like electricity running through the dashboard of his car. And then the car slows down, of course, and stops. So the guy got out of his car. Uh, He pulled the hood open. He's trying to figure out what was wrong with his car. He thought it must have been some electrical problem because it was like electricity all over his dashboard. And he was horrified. He loved this car. It was his baby, you know. But uh, there was nothing wrong under the hood. He got back in the car and it started right up. But when he started up, he had this voice in his head tell him, you are very, very tired. You need to go back to your barracks and go to sleep. Um, You know, he felt compelled by this. And and I know what he meant because we're highly suggestible when we're in in the presence of of this this thing, you know, This, this phenomenon. So he went back to his barracks. Uh, it was just his bunkmate was was there, and it was him. Uh, it was the weekend, so it wasn't like they were going AWOL or anything. Most of the people were gone. It was just him and, and, and his buddy. So he got up into his rack, and he was, he was up on the top rack, and he s- started falling asleep when he felt himself physically lift up and go through the roof. And he said that he could feel the rafters. He could feel... It was, it was physical. It wasn't like an out-of-body experience. And the way that he knew that was was that his friend went looking for him, and then his friend was scared because he couldn't find him. He saw him go to bed. He wasn't in the, you know, he wasn't in the loo. He was not where he was supposed to be. He was just gone. Um, the next thing this guy knows is he's in, he's in low-Earth orbit. He sees this craft. He goes into the craft, And it was tall, gray-type entities that had him. Um, For this guy, they were actually threatening towards him. They told him, because he couldn't move, he was statuesque, like you mentioned the kid being. That's a very common thing when people have have a close encounter, is is that they, they, they become like quadriplegics or like statues. I had one case where the mom was pointed up at a flying saucer and her, her hand just stayed there with the pointing finger, you know, for like, she was like a statue, um, her little daughter pulling on her pants leg and she, mom's not listening to her. And there's this spaceship hanging over everything. And the kid was scared to death. But anyway, with this Marine, uh, they actually purposefully, I think, tried to scare him to see how he would react and the way he reacted, at first he was he was like wanted to punch them and thinking of, but then it went. He he started praying, he started thinking these these good like positive thoughts and stuff uh, that he wasn't. It, and and he said, "You cannot," because they told him they said, "We've got your body now, and next we're going to take your soul." And he said, "Well, you can't take my soul because God owns my soul." And the next thing he knows, he's he's in the middle of his barracks. Uh, his his buddy comes running up to him. The guy was like crouched, fetal position kind of stuff, except on his knees. And he said that he had black blotches and red blotches all over his body. His clothes were all disheveled. It was a mess. And uh, <laughs> he's talking about aliens and being in low Earth orbit and being threatened and all this. So the guy, his buddy got him to go into the showers and to wash up and become, you know, presentable. But th- that wasn't when it ended for him. He started having these dreams that were realer with, than dreams is a way that he expressed it. And I hear this a lot from people where he would actually be flying a craft himself. He said that he found himself flying a, a, like a spherical craft over the San Diego Navy harbor that's out here and he could see all the ships down below he could see everything but he could he could control this thing with his mind and it it, it, he said that it felt like the ets were trying to teach him how to control a spaceship (laughs) i mean where 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 is that from you know 
you know what's weird, Mike, is it's not the first, it's not the last time I've heard that story because I had somebody else say the same thing that, you know, she had, it started out sort of like your classic abduction. And then she was being taught how to fly this craft. And the hell of the thing is that there are a bunch of guys in the military base that's over here that um, they said that they saw this blue spherical craft that was hovering over the military base. And it, it made like, you know, some of the news reports out in San Diego area again. Uh, but it was exactly a match to what she said that, that you know, apparently she was the person that was flying this thing. So <laughs> according to some experiencers, you know, our, our, our visitors are teaching them how to fly these, you know, craft. I don't know why or, uh, but, uh, you know, that we don't see a whole lot of the DNA farming anymore. Used to be people would have their sperm or ovum taken and stuff like that, you know, and even with me, it's like the blood was all taken, uh, you know, talking to one official that I know. And I was saying, well, they didn't say, you know, it wasn't like I got the Whitley Strieber treatment. Uh, they didn't take, you know, sperm cells or anything like that, but they took a whole hell of a lot of blood. And she was saying, well, what do you think your DNA is? Your blood is like, that is the main source of DNA. That's what, you know, if any of the genealogical companies that's what they will have you send them you know is a little thing of blood sample <laughs> so but anyway uh it's just a very very weird phenomenon uh i i mean honest to god if you want me to come back sometime i can just regale you with case after case for an hour you know <laughs> we we probably need a couple well, I mean, I, I'm unlimited. You can go for another hour if you want. Yeah, well, my wife is probably going to want dinner in a couple of minutes. So, okay, well, uh, duty calls. You can say goodbye then. Uh, yeah, well, let's do this again if you want. You know, and I, I've got a mil I've got a bunch of cases that are very interesting, and, and I like the weird ones. That's I'm like John Keel that way, I guess. Uh, well, there is no such thing as a real boring UFO sighting they all the the good ones the real ones all seem to have some weird thing about them that sets them apart one yeah. thing i wanted to say to you before we leave is that uh if you have any uh experiencers who want to go public who wouldn't mind being on my show i'm uh would love to uh help people come out if there's anybody you know that wants to come out into the public i uh, that you feel is a real experiencer, I'm game, more than game. Just send them my way, please. Sure. I mean, I, I get asked that so often, and it's it's very hard. You know, there's a ridicule factor out there. And, it, you know, I mean, even I was on Ancient Aliens a few months ago. They wanted me to tell my, my contact story. And I had a really, I had a discussion it with my wife because you know i mean the the conversation around the family dinner table at thanksgiving is going to be different this year you know <laughs> if anything is better than talking politics or whatever else people normally argue about at those things you know but um i know that the the ridicule factor keeps a lot of people from from telling their own stories um, again, you know, thank you to Kathleen Martin, you know, Kathy made it okay for me to tell my story. I, you know, she started talking about her own contact stories. It's very different from mine is more positive uh, than mine is, but, uh, for her, you know, there was already ridicule because of Betty and Barney Hill, you know, or her aunt and uncle. Um, and, but she started sharing with people about her own uh, experience. And I think that that inspired me. Uh, I saw Kathy being so brave and, and talking to stuff. And, and, uh, and I think that uh, the more that we do that, the more that we talk about our own experiences, it makes it easier for other people to do it. Well, I got a couple of people that, that are, are comfortable, but they'll go if, if you, if you don't show their face or, you know, there's just people lose their jobs over it. 
I mean, I lost a nursing job once. Do audio. We can always just do audio. Mm-hmm. If somebody doesn't want to show their face, that might make it easier. Just do an audio interview, and that's fine with me. And we can call. They can, you know, not reveal their name, and you know. Uh, sure. I, I don't know that I have the technology to change their voice, but. Uh, I don't think people are so worried about their voice. They just don't want their identities out there. And we're really careful about that, it, it, you know, in the ERT especially. Um, you know, it's, it's. I still, you know, being a nurse, we kind of live by the HIPAA law rules where, you know, you, you, the name is out of there. You don't tell anybody's, you know, diagnosis, prognosis, any personal information. Or you get your ass sued under you, you know, yeah. and it, and it, and and I know Mufon's uh, they're they're worried about that as well as they should be, um, because there is a ridicule factor out there. I mean, I did lose one job because they saw me talking about the phenomenon on some silly TV show, and it wasn't even that you know I wasn't talking about myself. I was just talking about the phen- it was Motor Mythbusters. It was it was cars versus ufos i think was that the sh- it was like one of the early things i did actually it was before that i guess it was a buzzfeed thing that i was on but they literally they didn't want me to come back and i asked why and they you know the the wife like posted the little alien emoji you know and that was all they wrote you know it's like wow so i'm losing my job because of uh, my my ufo work oh well um, well, it, you so weren't, people are you weren't meant to have that job. You weren't. You weren't yeah, meant to I know. Stay, stay on that job. I literally couldn't be doing it now and doing what I'm doing. So, you know, you can't work 12-hour nursing shifts and 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 be a state director in, in California. There, there would it's it's like a full-time job with no pay. You know, it's a volunteer I, job. I've but I love in, it. I've worked in uh, several hospitals, military hospitals, but. I know where you're coming from as far as your what you used to do, but I appreciate you being on the show. It was uh, a pleasure speaking with you. It's a lot. Thank you I, so much. Actually, I I didn't realize you would be as in, anywhere near as entertaining as you are. And so, you know, you, you did <laughs> well, a you good too, job. Mike. You did a real good job. Thank you. This was uh, fun. And well, so, I'd be happy to come back if you want to talk cases next time. We can just absolutely. We'd love, enough about me, you know. <laughs> I'd love to talk cases. I appreciate you being on the show. I look forward to having you back. And thank you. Uh, is there anything uh, you want to tell the audience before you sign up? Sure. If if any of this sounds familiar to you guys out there, um, if if you had an experience like something we've been talking about or if you've seen a ufo if you go to mufon.com it says it's got two little buttons you can push you know report a ufo or report uh, an entity um you know push either or, or both and somebody like me in your area because we work regionally will get a hold of you take you seriously and investigate your case and and uh you know it, it's uh there's again, you know, it's a voluntary position for us that work at MUFON, uh, but we're all we all love this phenomenon, and it's uh, I, I do it for love of the phenomenon. It's my favorite thing in the universe. So, so that's what I would leave people with. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for being <laughs> on the show. Uh, I welcome you back, and let me go ahead and stop the recording. All right, thanks so uh, much, Mike.